my first question for you is housing in Nebraska and how do you plan on getting more affordable housing for people in the state? Well, the fir first, first problem we're running into is we we'll start low hanging fruit that's property taxes, right? Property taxes are increasing, uh, property valuations are increasing and that, that cost is being pushed towards the consumer, to the, to the, the uh, uh, resident or even the the, the buyer themselves so we need to fix our property tax issue uh, i'm a big proponent for a free market system i know we are uh, i know a number of individuals and i talk to them who are builders who build homes and the market's there we can get those homes built for people um part of this is also growing our our rural area a lot of these housing issues we find in more rural nebraska uh, like i said builders are going to build homes if there's a business there if they can make money off of and what I want to do is work with them to really start reinvesting into our own state to try to get not only house, uh, affordable housing built, but also make the current properties and, and, and houses that we have now more affordable. That's where property taxes come in. Whereas we're also uh, bringing in new business and spreading it out more into rural areas like building a better infrastructure, which will do that, uh, will also drive the cost of the property to more... Um, or bring in, bring in more homes and bring in more opportunities to be able to, to get housing to people who need it. Okay, and you touched on my next question, which are property taxes. Uh, what are your thoughts or plans on lowering them? And also a uh, separate question is how are you going to improve the economy and here in the state? Yeah, well, first thing that's definitely destroying our economy is our property taxes. Now, we always wanna to try to get property tax. Free. Obviously that's that's a big thing. But we got to understand that the system is so broken right now. What it needs to be done is completely overhauled. We need to get rid of our, our system right now and putting a new system that's actually going to be work that's going to work and be sustainable. Now, I'm, I personally am a proponent for the epic consumption tax for a number of different reasons. Uh, I believe it's the it's a, an 80 20 solution that we have today, but it's the best solution that we have. The little bit of tweaking, honestly, believe it's going it, to it will be the best in Nebraska. Statistics are showing that would be great for Nebraska and getting rid and the epic tax plan in itself briefly gets rid of uh, real estate and personal property tax, inheritance tax, corporate tax, and income tax it would be a sole single consumption tax on new goods and services only. It's a one time tax and it takes into consideration and provides assistance for those of lower income. So that tax burden is not being uh, uh, too much for, for some of our residents. We want to make sure it's fair and even. But also, it allows us to really capitalize on income from outside citizens, outside residents, right? And, and that way, we can increase our income as a state and not actually increase the taxes on Nebraskans. It would lower their tax burden quite significantly. Okay, thank you. Um, another topic, we're just burning through these, uh, infrastructure and broadband. So this is a huge thing, especially in the rural areas. How do you plan on getting more access to the internet in rural parts of the state? Yeah, the great question. So now I don't know if you knew this, but I'm actually from Northeast Nebraska, from rural Nebraska. That's where I grew up. That's where I was raised. So I understand exactly what you're talking about and the need to get rural broadband into rural, uh, uh, in, into these other areas of Nebraska. Now we have a plan. Our administration has a plan to do that already. Now the problem is, is that this plan is not sufficient in my opinion. Uh, and that's, and, and, and my opinion comes from a, a technical, a long time technical background. Uh, it's not going to provide what Nebraskans need. And so I want to uh, revamp that plan. I want to make sure that we're going to get rural broadband where uh, out to these areas. Uh, and that's going to be working with private industry here. Uh, I think the cur current plan and providing funds to be able to encourage that is great. I don't have a problem with that. The, it's the standard, just the, uh, uh, requirements to ensure that we're getting a solution in place that's actually going to work, right? So that is a, that is a, a, an important critical step to getting a solid, what I call ready to break ground infrastructure, which is a major issue in Nebraska, right? If we want to grow Nebraska, because that's our biggest issue right now is growth and population retainment. We need to have an infrastructure that's ready to go. See, companies, they don't want to come to Nebraska and wait a couple of years for us to build the roads, build the, the grid to, to uh, get all the, the amenities and utilities into place. And then they have to wait another year, year and a half on top of that just to build their own infrastructure, right? We need to have a system. I, be I believe the adage that you build it, they're going to come, especially when we 
get, when we change our tax system, we have a ready to break ground infrastructure, we have broadband out to rural areas, we start capitalizing on some of these, uh, some of the already infrastructure that's available in other areas of Nebraska, let's say uh, Dana College in Blair, for example, right? Or the old, the old Cabela's building in Sydney. We can also utilize these areas that are not directly located in the metropolitan area. We're gonna be growing the state left and right. People and companies are gonna to wanna to come here. Uh, and, and I'm a, a huge supporter on that. And I prioritize, especially broadband integration to our state. I prioritize that. But Lauren, we have to be smart about it. We have to make sure we put in a solution that's actually going to fix the problem and that's going to last and, 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 and be sustainable. And right now, the project just doesn't just doesn't do that, I, I'm afraid. And what are some of the solutions that you would propose if you were elected to fix this issue? For, for broadband? Yeah. Well, it would be a requirement. So not to get all techy on you, but we'll just, I'll just keep it real brief. Uh, the, the current legislative bill requires that um, internet service providers provide X amount of, of speed, right? Upload and download speed when they put this network in place. And I've talked to Governor Ricketts one-on-one -on -one about this specifically. And I asked him, I said, Governor, so at what point do they have to prove that this network will hit this certain speed? Right. And he says, once they put once they lay the lines, it's essentially once the network is there, they show proof. And then that's when they get paid. I said, well, what about after that? Right. Most people, I think, understand that the more people you put on a network, an Internet network, the slower the speeds get. Right. Or if there's any issues with that network, your speeds, it's a very delicate network. So what's going to happen? What I foresee happening is we're going to get Nebraskans on this. Nobody's going to properly manage that speed. Nobody's going to really care about it. When Nebraskans are getting a tenth of what they were expecting to get, who are they going to call? Not the state government. Well, they will, and the state government say, no, nah, we're done. So it's a lack of accountability. It's a lack of oversight. And what it is, is we have a plan that was put in place, and I'm not trying to denigrate anybody that's trying to push broadband. The problem is, is that we got people trying to push broadband that don't have the experience and know fully how to put a plan, a technical plan like this together that will actually fix the issue. Now, we haven't talked about that, but my background is in technology, right? I've, I've worked in uh, military industry, healthcare industry, and now private sector. I've done a lot of this. And so I bring a very, very extensive technical background and I can see these problems as well as a principle of just having foresight. 360 degree perspective, you bring people together that know, not just me, I don't know everything, but I'm gonna get people that do we're going to see this from every single angle. We're going to understand the problem and we're going to provide, we're going to understand the solution and we're going to integrate something that's actually going to work. And then another thing affecting people who live in rural Nebraska is accessible health care. But I don't want to just focus on every question being rural Nebraskans because that's only part of the population here. So part two of that question would be, um, as we know, many healthcare workers are feeling this burnout from COVID, especially in bigger places. I, I mean, even here in Kearney, there are, we have two bigger hospitals that a lot of people go to. That burnout is there for those nurses and those doctors after COVID. So part one of my question is, how would you uh, propose any solutions about accessible healthcare in rural areas and also addressing burnout for uh, healthcare workers across the state? Good questions, Lauren. And I will say there's those those are actually quite extensive issues. <laughs> There's not an easy solution to those. So let's start with how do we get better healthcare access in a rural environment? Well, I'm aware and I've talked to a number of administrators uh, and, and healthcare spans obviously a lot, as you know. So we're going to start first off with the elderly care. We're seeing uh, retirement homes. We're seeing uh, elderly care. These centers are closing down. They just don't have the funds. They just don't have the people. They don't have the people because there's no people in that area, okay? We, again, that goes back to the growth problem. You see a lot of this is just one big cobweb of issues. So we retain, we retain our people, we have growth, we're going to bring people there that can work in these positions. Um, but a lot of it comes down to financial issues. Either they can't pay properly, they just don't have the funding to keep the lights on. And, 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 and I don't believe throwing money at every problem is a solution, but sometimes that is the solution. And I think in this case, that's what we need to make sure is that they get the money that they need, the proper reporting. We want to be accountable for our tax dollars, but we want to make sure that their needs are being met. And a lot of that seems to be coming down to costs from what I'm hearing from them. Now, I mentioned I worked in the uh, technology and the healthcare uh, sector uh, for 10 years. And in fact, I actually managed the telepharmacy program um, 
uh, the technical uh, part of the te uh, telepharmacy program for Nebraska Medicine. I'm a big proponent for telehealth, right? And this goes back to getting good rural broadband, good speeds available, because we can give access, and we do it now today all across the state. We provide telehealth from some of these larger hospitals. So that means that you or anybody out, maybe out in Chatterton or, or Rushville or somewhere out uh, in a more remote area of the state, they can get access to one of the world's best cardiologists, right, in Omaha or even anywhere around the world for that matter, from a local clinic or even in some instances their own home. Right? This is what we need to do. We need to leverage technology to be able to get our state up to speed and provide those opportunities to, uh, uh, to supplement that healthcare. Um, telepharmacy briefly, it's the same way. How, what we did in telepharmacy is that uh, there are requirements that a pharmacy has to, a pharmacist has to be full-time there uh, during the operations of the pharmacy. What we did is we had pharmacists that worked in different states and they remoted and, and fulfilled and supplemented those roles as full-time pharmacists completely remote, which means that we were that meant that they were able to keep that pharmacy in a in the rural area without having to pay a large a large wage to a, a high wage to a pharmacist because they are expensive, right? They're professionals and they're they're experts in their field. Um, so thinking outside the box and especially utilizing technology, we can increase that access to rural health quite easily. Uh, those are just a couple ideas. Okay. Uh, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add on that topic? Well, I know that was the first part of your question. Right, right. The second part of the question was, uh, could you remind me on that one? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's um, addressing the burnout that nurses and healthcare workers across the state have seen and are feeling currently now after you know COVID. And it's not completely gone still. Um, but yeah, addressing that after you know two years of nonstop dealing with COVID patients, new variants, all of that type of stuff. Yeah. I'm not sure what I'm not sure how involved Governor Ricketts was with our healthcare system and identifying those those real issues. <clears throat> uh, I think some of that comes from the fact that they weren't able to staff people. Uh, we've seen there's been a nursing shortage, staffing shortage for quite some time, even before COVID. Uh, and we want to encourage nurses. Uh, it's it's an exceptional field to be in, and it's absolutely needed and appreciated. And we want to encourage that, and that starts in a number of areas. Uh, we've seen it in our society, uh, a thankfulness for our healthcare professionals. I think that's a good start, as well as making sure we have good benefits and wages. But it's a hard job. And when you have something like COVID comes in here, all it does is just exacerbate any issues that are there. And some of these come down to simply policies from the healthcare facility um, and, 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 how we, and how we address it as a state. Well, what we're going to say we don't want to have burnout. We do have to understand that we just dealt with a worldwide pandemic, right? And we're still finishing dealing with worldwide pandemic. This is one of those issues that we have to dig our heels in and we have to push forward. Um, and as and as a state, what can we do uh, other than perhaps some reformation on our licensing to try to get other nurses uh, into certain fields and take a good hard look at that? Uh, like I said, and um, I don't think money, I don't think throwing money at the situation is going to fix it. Um, but from a state, there's, I still need to dig into a couple of things. I, there, you know, I have some basic ideas, but my understanding from the individuals I've talked to is that we've really just seen a big shortage in people. They're working crazy long hours and, and they're tired of dealing with it. And they're tired of the flip-flopping and policies. Well, you wear masks, you don't wear a mask. Um, we got to have some strong leadership on there that's going to decide, say, this is the plan. This is what we're going to continue with. Uh, and then provide the, the resources needed, depending on what plan that is. Okay, thank you. Um, one of my last questions for you, I've got two more. Um, how would you, if you're elected, support ag producers here in the state? Sure, absolutely. Well, first off, we need to address the fact that we have the big four meat processing, uh, meat packing issue, the monopoly that's been going on. Uh, and as governor, you get a lot of time to interface with the federal government. And what I would want to do is work with the federal government, start enforcing our antitrust laws that are already here. Now, that's one issue. Now, while that's going on, what I want to make sure we're doing is reinvesting in, in uh, startups of local meatpacking and processing uh, uh, facilities here in the state. And I've talked to some individuals who have recently started them up or are starting them right now. And, uh, and just I, I'm working on addressing their needs. A lot of it comes down to financial, financial uh, 
inputs, uh, grants. We want to make it easier. We want to try to have a, a, an easy process that we can be sure the money that we're giving there is going to help Nebraskans, but we also don't want it to take too long. Uh, Nebraskans will shop local. They will shop local, and if and, and we can fight the monopoly by having uh, good local processing plants here in, in Nebraska, we won't have a problem. We won't have a problem with that. And so our cattle farmers are really, they're really getting hit with this. Uh, and this is a major issue for them. Of course, property taxes. If I, I, every farmer I've talked to, whether it be a real crop farmer, whether it be a cattle farmer, uh, chicken farm, doesn't matter. Property taxes are terrible. And, uh, and you can only farm, you can only get so much for an acre of land. You can only put so much cattle on an acre of land. You can't just add more, you see? There, there's no way to, to in, increase your, um, your income there. And so property taxes have got to be fixed. And I don't mean, again, it's not a band-aid of the system. The system has got to go. We've got to get rid of our property taxes. Um, those, are, those are two of the big main issues that I'm seeing, as well as diversification in our trade. Right, we see that now there's a, a highly impending uh, potential war between Taiwan and China. China is a is a large exporter of our goods, our our um, our food, as well as we import a lot of equipment, farming equipment from them. And I think we need to make sure we have a plan that prepares Nebraskans that if we have a war like this, that trade is going to be interrupted, and that's going to hurt a lot of our farmers. And we need to have a plan. I'm not hearing it from our administration even today yet about warning Nebraskans about working with them, having a plan to uh, provide and, and ensure that we're not, we can mitigate the effect as much as possible. But also diversifying our trade with a lot of other stable partners across the world and other states. Uh, and that's going to take a strong governor and in working closely with our new next, whoever, whomever our next secretary of state is. Okay. And the last one for you is why should people vote for you? Well, first and, first and foremost, uh, my priorities, right? This is what differentiates me from a lot of other candidates is my priorities first and foremost are constitutional liberties and rights, right? I wanna restore and I wanna protect our liberties. And, and the great thing about liberties is it doesn't, it's not just a Republican thing, it's all Nebraskan thing, right? And this is important. We want people to be able to decide for themselves what's best for themselves and their families, right? We also need to have uh, a vision. We need somebody who sees and understands the problem at the core, right? What I mentioned earlier is that 360 degree perspective. We understand the problem entirely and we have a vision and a plan to say, here's a solution, here's how we can implement it, right? I'm that individual. Next is we need somebody who has, I mean, politics is all about people. The only way you're gonna get meaningful change in here, especially if you have a good idea, is to be able to work with our elected officials, whether it be legislative bodies, secretary of state, so forth and so on. You have to be able to work those individuals, especially those who aren't of the same political party as you or have a difference of opinions, right? And that's a, that's a, that's a skill, that's an attribute that takes a, a practice and honing. Next thing is also strong leadership, right? And this is something I've developed a lot in the past six years I've invested personally in for uh, a lot of training and opportunities to strengthen myself as a leader. And, and, and we look at the governor and say, you're, you're the leader of the state. You'd be able to work with the people, right? As Ronald Reagan said, a leader is not defined by the great things he does, but the great things he gets the people to do. We need to have a strong leader, especially in this day and age that isn't afraid of some mean tweets, or isn't afraid of, of a reputation or have anything to protect, but truly steps in here and says, I'm gonna do what's best for Nebraskans, even if that means taking the harder, more challenging road. All right. And then like we talked, I just mentioned reputations. I don't bring any strings attached. Right. I'm a middle class, uh, middle class guy. I've been campaigning for 14 months across this entire large state, all the while being married and managing a family and two younger children and working a day job. Right. Because I, and, and, and so I relate to Nebraska. I relate to the priorities uh, and the priorities, the values, the issues, the principles that most Nebraskans have and, and those issues that they're feeling, um, I feel them too, okay? And again, my priority is doing really what's best for Nebraska. A lot of great ideas, I have those skills to be able to work with people and not only as a manager, which I am currently today, not only with my technological background, which I think is very, very important actually, considering we live in a tech, tech, tech age, um, but also my leadership with skills and abilities. And most importantly, I'm a principled individual. Right. I believe in standing on 
principle because what is right is right and what is wrong is wrong. And that doesn't change because somebody has a difference of opinion. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I appreciate it. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add that I didn't ask or any anything else? I, I just like to say, uh, I mentioned that I'm a guy, I, I consider myself of the people and for the people. And one, one area to prove that is I always welcome communication. If people have questions, if they have issues, concerns, reach out. In fact, in most cases, you're gonna, you're gonna get a response from me. I prioritize, it's important to me that those who have issues and questions will hear it from me and not some campaign volunteer or staffer and get some canned message. Uh, I really wanna be able to connect with Nebraskans. And so I encourage that. And people can contact me on my website, rightnowforgovernor.com if they have any questions or want some clarification, some issues, or would like to express some of their concerns. Yeah, I'd love to hear from Nebraskans. All right. Thank you so much. It was great to meet you. And um, yeah, I hope you have a great day. Thank you. You too as well.